Well, last week, some of you in this room crossed over to something new. You took a step of faith and you said, man, I want to walk in the Spirit-filled life. It's not enough that I'm just born again. I also want to be Spirit-filled, controlled by the Spirit. I want to have the thoughts of Christ. I don't want to be a Christian and be carnals. An oxymoron, I know it's weird like a vegetarian butcher, but there's a lot of them out there. Carnal Christians. But the power of God and the Spirit-filled life brings you to a place where you get to walk as Jesus walked. Now, when you hear, get to walk as Jesus walked, I don't know what you think of. What is it you get to do in this walk? You might go, man, I get to walk on the water. I get to heal the sick. I get to do... No, you get to hear the voice of the Father. Because there is nothing greater than that, my friend. Right? And that's one of the things I took note of when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, probably about 19 years old, a year or so after getting saved. And I noticed my, my walk went from being this horizontal wonder to this vertical, wondrous mystery where I was like, wow, God, I'm hearing your voice. And now I'm, I can be like some of those people I used to make fun of that would go, well, God said, said this. You know, and, and I'm very careful about God said because we can overplay that card sometimes, right? But, but really, to really hear the voice of the Lord is just, there's nothing like it. And, and, uh, and I found that that first year and a half of just reading my Bible and creating this foundation and knowing the heart and mind of God and having a basis to go, is this God or is it not? Because if it doesn't line up with the written word, then the spoken word, that's, that's you know, bad pizza I ate or something. I don't know. It wasn't the voice of God, right? But let me tell you what, when you get that anointing, it's incredible. When you cross over the Jordan, that is the picture of the spiritual life, is it not? Man, we're going from just being covered in the blood and and being baptized in the Red Sea and wandering in the wilderness to this place of truly possessing the promises of God, the abundant life that Jesus promised us to have. But one of the things you will take note of, and maybe you did this week, is that when you begin to experience that anointing, you will find out that this promised land has problems. It's kind of like going and getting a checkup and finding out something you didn't know. You feel fine, but there's, something's being revealed because something's looking deeper. When the anointing of God comes, things and you get revealed that were just lying dormant. And part of how they're revealed is the opposition that comes to your stand to walk in the spiritual life. Do you think for a second that a blood-covered saint can go, God, fill me with an anointing and a power, God, that just this, this dynamite power, that just it's a light that moves darkness, fill me that. Do you think hell's going to get back and say, hey, hey, get some popcorn out, let's watch this. No, there's going to be opposition. But I want you to know that is the sovereign plan of God. That is the spiritual weightlifting that God gives his anointed. Did you hear that? God gives a spiritual weightlifting program to his anointed. It's called hell. Hell opposes heaven whenever it moves. And believe me, man, heaven comes to earth when the dove descends upon somebody. You with me? Remember when Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit and the heavens opened and the Spirit of God came descending like a dove? What was the next thing he experienced? Confrontation with the enemy. That's what you can expect when you receive the anointing of God. What's the anointing? You're talking in terms, Dave, I don't understand. The anointing, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit coming in you that you're saved. I'm talking about the Spirit of God coming upon you, that anointing, that manifest presence of God. And there is a difference between Emmanuel, God with us, between the Spirit of Christ, the indwelling divine nature of God. There's a difference between that, my friend, and the manifest presence of God that comes and just radically changes everything. Because if every Christian was walking in the manifest presence of God, the church would be in a different state right now. How do you argue with that one, right? We're not walking in that. 
But those that say, yes, Lord, I'm going to get in the upper room and I'm going to wait. I'm going to stand on the edge of the Jordan and I'm going to wait three days and I'm going to just acknowledge the power that God can raise from the dead. I'm going to observe the Passover. I'm going to observe the cross. I'm going to just put my heart and soul and mind into this step of faith. I'm going to put the sole of my foot, the sole of my being into the Jordan. I'm stepping in. Man, this is what happens. The same thing that happened to the people of God in Israel. Look at me with me, chapter 5 of Joshua. It says, So it was when the king, all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan and from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Wow. So here you have the Canaanites, which if you were with us probably a couple of years ago when we did a five-part series on strongholds, there was part four and part five. We talked about the different tribes in Canaan, how they are a picture of the demonic, even the very names and definitions of those things. If you want some more detailed study, jump back on that train. It'll be a wonderful ride. You'll enjoy it. It'll be insightful, I promise you. But for our purposes today, understand that this promised land that we're entering into, this is not a picture of heaven because heaven has no opposition. Heaven has no enemies. But the spirit-filled life, my friend, does. And so as they're crossing over the spirit-filled life, there's these Canaanites, these Hittites. One of the Hittites actually means squatters. What a name, huh? What tribe are you? We're the tribe of the squatters. I want you to know that's what demonic presence does. They're squatters. They come into an area that does not belong to them. How could God just wipe out the Canaanites? Well, we'll get into that question. That's a valid question. But understand, this is not where they belonged. So the enemies of God are someone where they don't belong. Interesting. Why would God allow that? Why would God allow his enemies to be somewhere where his kids belong? Because he wants his kids to go. He wants his kids to go walk in authority, to go walk in power. And these guys crossing the Jordan, I'm not talking about the three million. It wasn't three million that were walking in power that were causing the enemy to fear. It was a different group that we'll, we'll get into here in a moment. But I want the first thing I want you to take note of is the correlation of Jesus crossing the Jordan in opposition, spiritual weightlifting, the people of God crossing the Jordan, Israel, opposition, and you and I that walk in the Spirit for life, and God ordains this for a higher purpose than we see at the moment. Why would God not just take us home? Why is it we just didn't get saved? Well, Dave, because the Great Commission. Hey, he doesn't need us for the Great Commission. He can use angels to preach the gospel. We get to be his ambassadors to preach the gospel. How cool is that? Right? Right. He could use angels. He did use angels. He came and shared the gospel pretty much with Mary, and you see them sharing that. But man, once the church came on board, once the bride was born, that honor and privilege came to the bride of Jesus Christ to come and proclaim the good news. Wow. How cool is that? We'll talk about a promotion. But it's not just sharing the gospel that we're here for. Listen to this in Ephesians 3. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Whew, that's good. Somebody say Ephesians 6, huh? Oh yeah, those principalities, those powers. God's intent in part in leaving us here is that through the church, the body of Christ, that the power of God may be proclaimed in heavenly places, heavenly realms, according to his internal purpose that he accomplished in Christ, Jesus our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence far out. Wow, so as a believer, when I am covered by the blood and I receive the divine nature of God, and, but then I take that step to really just dive into the whole principle that he's not just my Savior, but he's my Lord. And I begin to walk in that surrendered attitude towards Christ and the mission of God on your earth. And I walk in that, I will receive opposition, but God has so ordained that. That's part of my purpose here as the body of Christ. But it's also a purpose that serves for my own growth and sanctification because I'm growing through that. Right? Remember Jesus said, hey boys, 
get in the boat and cross over to the other side. Where did he send them? Legion. Sent them right to the demonic. How about that? We want to sit there and make excuses. Oh, that was for the days of the Bible. We don't deal with that today. That's what hell wants you to think. Believe that. Now, I'm not one of these people that think, wow, there's a demon under every rock. There's a demon of tobacco. There's a demon of this demon. Please, I think most of our problems are our stinking flesh and lack of obedience to the truth of God. The truth be known. (laughs) Really, we, we give the enemy ammunition. We really do simply by disobedience. Okay. But understand that spiritual warfare is a big part of our existence and purpose of why we're here on planet Earth. Listen to this scripture in Hebrews. It says, when Christ had suffered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. Don't you love that? I I just hear the words, it is finished in that. Oh, love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. That's, we, we could stop there for the day and I'd be good. <laughs> it's one sacrifice for sins. It says, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting waiting from the time until his enemies should be made a footstool at his feet. We're in that process right now. Do you know Satan is still the prince of this world? Demons still have authority and real estate rights in the souls of man here on planet Earth right now. It's still going on, folks. Now, time's going to come when that's going to be changed, and his enemies will be the Lord's footstool. How's that going to happen? Through the church. Through his bride. That's amazing to me. And we are to be a people, check it out, that go, you know what? The enemy is scared to death of what I bring. Isaiah 59, 19 is a verse the Lord has impressed upon my heart for this year. I brought this to the leadership uh, probably three months ago, but Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The enemy comes at the church. The carnal church. Those that are easy to pick off. Those that their God is their stomach not the Savior. What is that standard then, you might ask? What's the deal? How how can I be one of these anointed believers that when the enemy hears I'm coming, fear strikes his heart. The enemy trembles when I come. I want to walk in that kind of power and victory. I want to walk in that type of authority. How do I do that? Well, look at Joshua 4, verse 13. It says about 40,000 prepared for war. So not 3 million, 40,000 of the 3 million, right? Prepared for war, crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. And on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him. And they feared Moses all the days of his life. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, are you sure? Hmm. Command the priest who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. In Jordan, Joshua therefore commanded the priest, saying, Come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land, that the water of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Wow. Remember? Joshua 5, the enemies, their hearts are melting. They're trembling. Why? Because of three million slaves that were complacent for 40 years? No. Because of a remnant of 40,000 that their focus is to raise up the standard. What's the standard? We just read it and we sang it today. It's the presence of God. I in of myself, you in of yourself, we have no authority over the enemy. It is Jesus, our commander-in-chief, our Joshua, our Yeshua. See, you notice the 40,000, they are following Jesus, Yeshua, who is high and lifted up, and they're carrying the presence of God, and the enemy is hearing this, that we're scared to death. Remember, Legion, what do you want with me, son of God? Wow. When Jesus is high and lifted up in my life, and I'm all about the presence of God, the enemy fears what I'm bringing.
I wonder why it is that some Christians cause demons to flee while other Christians live in defeat. There are Christians who put out a for rent sign to demons. Now, if you want to argue about Christians being demon-possessed or oppressed, I'm not going to get into a war of semantics with you. I'm not interested. I will not be distracted. We spend so much time getting into foolish arguments, and we miss the whole mission. The point is that Christians, Galatians 3.1, can be bewitched, oppressed. We can give them dinner. The serpent was sent to feed on the dust of the earth after the curse of sin. You know that stuff that your flesh is made of? What do you think demons feed on? Our fleshly nature. Why is it some Christians strike fear in the heart of demons while others walk in oppression. The difference is the presence of God. The difference is that manifest presence of God. Not every Christian carries that anointing. There are those today that are of my conservative, precious family of God that would say that's not true. I don't buy that. All Christians carry the presence of God. Yes, I agree, but can't we reason together to say that the church is a mess? Can't we reason and come together to say there are Christians that are living in carnality and defeat and they are oppressed by the enemy? Then let's just, let's just camp there for a moment. Why? Because if we can get to the why, then we can stop being the, those on that crossed over, but they're not walking in power versus those that they're crossing over, they're really walking in that anointing. And I believe there is a key in James 2. Listen, with the whole conversation of faith versus works, which we don't have time to get into today, there is an insight in this verse, I believe, for us. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble or shudder. Wow. Wow. So what causes demons to tremble? You ready? Believing there is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Right? God, Elohim, a compound word for God. Three but one. One God. This is the key to walking in the manifest presence of God. Lucifer lost sight of that in heaven as a worship leader, I might add. Isaiah 14, with the king of Tyre, a dual prophecy, speaking of Lucifer, it says, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who are weakened the nations. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars, and I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north, and I will descend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. There is only one God, and you're not Him. See, before we can take possession of the promised land, there first, first must be a conquest of our delusions of godhood. Can I say that again? Before we can take possession of the promised land, there first must be a conquest over our delusions of godhood. We're not God. Now, not many of us would get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, you know everything. Well, maybe some of you would. <laughs> My wife sure would do that. I know you're thinking that, right? Some of you might not necessarily go, I'm just stronger than anybody else. 
I know more. I have more. I'm never wrong. You know anybody says they're never wrong? Only God is never wrong, by the way. Right? Point being is we do have these delusions of Godhood, and God wants us to deal with that. That's why he's given us a blueprint. I love the Word of God. I'm not talking about a book. I'm talking about Jesus. He's the Word of God. But this speaks of his heart and his mind, his plan for my life. And it's something I use against the enemy, as we see in Luke 4 with Satan. When he said, you're going to go into the promised land, you're going to possess all that I have for you. Something interesting he said, going back to Joshua 1, he says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do. Not memorize. To do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Success is contingent on obedience. We can't expect to think, I'm going to live the Spirit-filled life. Now you got to go, but Dave, I can't be obedient without the Spirit. So uh, th- th- there's a paradox here. So which is it? I mean, do I have to be obedient so I get the Spirit? Or do I get the Spirit and then I can be obedient? I- I'm confused. I like that answer, yes. That works for me. We just take ourselves way too serious. Just be a sheep. Follow the shepherd. Do what he says. Hey, if he says, ask for the Holy Spirit, then ask, and he's going to give, and he's going to fill. And then when he says, if you love me, obey my commandments, then then love him and obey. And, and, And just don't worry about figuring all that out. Just do what he says. Instead of going, I don't understand. I mean, why am I having such a rough time with the enemy? It seems like I'm, I'm always sick. I'm living in depression. I have, I'm on medication. I can't have a relationship. Every relationship is broken. I, I've been through two divorces. I mean, it, nothing works out for me. I know hell's got it out for me, and I just don't understand why I'm not possessing land. Why can't I walk in the fruit of the Spirit? Why can't I have the peace of God? I ask, and it doesn't happen. Really? So God's a liar. No, 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 no. God's not a liar. It's just we want to possess the land, but we don't want to do all that is written in the Word. (laughs) Can can you just give me a happy meal, Lord? I I, I don't don't want to come and sit down and and have a conversation with you. Can I just drive through and get my blessing and get going? No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. That's not the way it works, and that's part of the problem. And that's why there is a contingency plan. There is a connection. There's covenant. When there's promised land, there is covenant. Remember what God said to Abraham concerning the promise of the promised land and the covenant, the connection with this, the response. He said to Abraham in Genesis 17, I give to you and your descendants, which we're reading about, After you, the land in which you are a stranger, and all the land of Canaan, and an everlasting possession, so I will be their God. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, ouch, and it shall be a sign, did you hear that? A sign of the covenant between me and you. Wow, now this is getting deep, but you're going to like this, I think. He says, if you're going to possess the promises, go into the promised land and have the fruit of the Spirit, these grapes the size of basketballs. For us, man, to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, the love of God, there's no greater miracle of power of God than love. Believe you me, right? You know, and, and, and yes, there'll be manifestations and things with the supernatural, natural. All this is going to happen. But he says, but there's a connection of you actually possessing. It's kind of like you can be in a church. It doesn't mean you are the church. You can pray the prayer, fill me, Holy Spirit. You can muster up the motions and kind of fake it and do these things. It doesn't really mean that you're walking in the promised land. There's a connection with possessing the promise and walking in obedience. And the sign is circumcision. I find it beautiful how the word of God is true and every man is a liar. Because it says here when they crossed over, what did they do? Look with me at Joshua chapter 5 verse 2. At the time the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourselves and circumcise the sons of Israel again a second time. Now, keep in mind before we move on, now this is the Bronze Age. So they had medals and things like that, but I love the great physician. He says, I want you to take this flint or this rock, something that bacteria doesn't grow on so there's no infection. How cool is that, right? 
But he's saying before you're going to cross over, before you're going to walk in this power and possess and cause fear in the heart of the enemy, there needs to be a circumcision. There needs to be a removal of flesh. Now he says for the second time, because we know that the only people here that are circumcised would be Joshua and Caleb. Every other male died. And throughout that whole journey for 40 years, no one got circumcised and no one practiced Passover. So there was no acknowledgement of the blood for 40 years and there was no acknowledgement of the removal of the flesh for 40 years. Maybe that's why they were walking in spiritual circles, you think? Maybe that's why the enemy was having his way, because we don't need the blood and we want the flesh. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come into Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way came to Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. Lord. That's why a lot of Christians are just being beat to death and being beat up by the enemy. 1 John 5, some of them are even sinning, which leads unto death. God's just taking them out of the equation and taking them home early. They're, they're getting there, but they're just escaping the flames. You're stinking up the joint, honestly, and using grace as an excuse to live for the world. Mm. You did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers, that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Read Deuteronomy 8, powerful chapter about the promise of the... Of the I was going to read it today, but you can read it on your own. So then Joshua circumcised their sons who had raised up in their place, and they were they're uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And so it was... When they had finished circumcising all the people, that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. And then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. It's a picture of the world, folks. Therefore, the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. Wow. Wow. This is one of those areas of scripture that's just a little uncomfortable for a guy to teach. <laughs> yeah. What was that like? Well, I'm sure, like I said earlier, that Joshua and Caleb were so glad they did this 40 years ago. Because <laughs> I would think the older you get, the more painful that would be, right? Right? So here you've got hundreds of thousands of men. They want to walk in victory. They want to walk possessing the promises of God. They want to walk in the manifest presence of God, not just with the name tag, I'm a Christian. Not just going through the Christian motions and principles in God's word. They want to walk in the power that reflects of a true relationship and a surrendered heart to God, to one God, right? See, I think there's so many of us that don't realize we're like Canaanites. We're polygamists. We are. It's a wonder that God doesn't strike us dead. I, I, I mean that. It really is. Why do I say that? Because we're adulterous, folks. The reason that the enemy does not tremble at your particular walk is because you're worshiping more than one God. There's flesh in the way. There's a spiritual circumcision that needs to take place. If you're willing to submit yourself to that which is not easy, I want you to know that circumcision was looked at by the Canaanites as insane. I can personally understand that. They were the only people being circumcised. Why would you do that? That's kind of how the world looks at us. Why would you not engage in this? This is so much fun. Why would you believe that? Why would you, you would not do that? You're, you're, you're just in bondage, man. You're a religious freak. That's just insane. No, I just believe in circumcision. I believe in the flesh being removed that life might come forth. 
his life, not mine. And I realize it's going to hurt. I realize it's humiliating. I realize there's fear in it, but love will come and cast out that fear. I believe God's word says, so I'm going to press in and I'm going to believe that if I truly offer myself to be a worshiper of God, one God, now you might say, but Dave, you're not, you're not resonating with me because I don't, I don't think I do that. Yeah, see, whenever we are unforgiving, we have delusions of Godhood. Do you know that? Oh, this is going to hit you right between the eyes, I promise you. It's amazing to me where God says, my grace is sufficient for my child. But we go, well, I know God's forgiven you, but I'm having a hard time with it. Oh, really, are you? So somehow you think your standard is higher than God's? Hmm, okay. Sounds like you're worshiping yourself. You can't be worshiping one God if you're worshiping yourself because you're not God, right? We can talk about that. So maybe that's why the enemy says, I'm not afraid of you. You don't cause me to tremble because you don't believe there's one God. I, I know you say you do, but the way that you look in the mirror tells me that's not true. Your codependence upon your spouse that you trust and rely upon them more than your profession for Jesus tells me you believe there's more than one God. All the divorces that you have tells me you believe there's more than one God. You know, uh, uh, the abortion that you had tells me that you believe you can play God. Wow. Never thought of it like that. Yeah, well, God does. Think about divorce. I mean, let me hammer that for a minute. Let no man separate what God has put together. Well, I know you put it together, but we're going to separate it. Delusions of Godhood. We are so filled with the same polygamist worship that the Canaanites in the church, and that's why we're powerless. They worshiped Baal. Their, their, their god of all gods was El. Interesting name. And the son of El was Baal. And they worshiped Baal for prosperity, a picture of Christ. They had Asherah, the goddess of sex, Molech. They did all kinds of things, and it was all about prospering in this world, where they would take a child and just say, here, I can't raise you because I can't feed you. So maybe if I put you in the burning arms of Molech and watch your body just sizzle, the promise is that, man, God will prosper me, and my crops will be plentiful this year. 1929, there were archaeologists that found clay pots and jars with babies buried in there because they were sacrifices to Baal, all that their harvest might be plentiful. What is that? It's playing God. I can't raise you, little Johnny, because I've got to pay for my $500,000 house and my two new brand new cars, so I can't raise you, so I'm going to put you somewhere where other people will raise you, and I know it's not the best thing for you, but it's just what we got to do. What's that? That's you trying to prosper yourself. What is it when we don't use the money God has given us for the kingdom of God, and we use it for us instead? What is that? Playing God. There are so many areas, guys, and if we're going to walk in power, we have to repent. And here is my three-point message of what makes demons tremble. You ready? Point one, worship one God. Number two, say it with me, worship one God. And number three, come on, worship one God, right? That, that, that's it. That's all inclusive. I think I'll write a book, What Makes Demons Tremble, and I'm going to fill it with 777 pages, and each one will say, Worship One God. And all of a sudden, it'll be the greatest spiritual warfare book you've ever read. Because if you apply it, you will bring the manifest presence of God and strike fear into the heart of the enemy. You'll sense things in people. You'll sense something that's going on in the demonic in people's lives, and you'll take authority over it when God leads. Sometimes there's a tormenting thing going on. Remember, remember the woman in 1 Corinthians, I think it was chapter uh, 5 or so, where the guy is sleeping with his stepmother, right? And, and Paul says, hand him over to Satan for the crucifixion of his flesh. It was a demonic oppression that God ordained. God is, I don't care what authority you have. You're not removing that if God says that's there for a reason, right? But you'll have the discernment to know what God is doing. But it has to come down. Will you submit yourself to a spiritual circumcision today? Listen to this scripture. 
James 4, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Whoa, come on, right? Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Why am I not walking in the manifest presence of God that causes the devil to flee? Because I love God. I say I got love God, but I love the world too. I'm going to ask the leaders right now to bring the elements forward because, folks, what we're going to do is we're going to come to God. You hear me? We're going to come to him. We're going to bear our hearts before him and we say, God, I know I had communion last week, but in my heart of hearts, I've spent 40 years going to the desert ignoring Passover and the power of the blood. I've spent 40 years ignoring there needs to be a removal of the flesh. There needs to be confession made, God. And I'm going to do that with you today. I want you to listen to this scripture. And as the worship team would come up as well, I want you to listen to this. Stand to your feet. We're not going to hand that out corporately. Just go ahead and bring that to the table. Hey, guys, Andrew, I'm going to bring it to the table. We're not going to hand it out corporately. We're just going to have it right here at the table, and folks can come for it as you are led. I don't want you taking the elements if you don't mean business. I don't want to enable hypocrisy. So if your heart really is to say, I want to walk in the power of Passover, the power of the blood of Christ in my life, and I am ready to come to God and say, God, I want to become vulnerable to you. I'm going to be real with you, God. Listen to what the scripture says. If anyone among you is sick, Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Do you believe that? And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, do you see a connection where when there is skin, flesh in the way, that the result of that can be sickness? I'm not here to say everyone's got a sniffle, you've got a demon, or you need to repent. I'm not saying that. I am saying that the Bible does bring a connection when there's habitual sickness and problems that it can be a manifestation of rebellion in our flesh and giving the enemy real estate. So James says, if that's the case, confess your sin. Confess them to one another, not just, all right, God, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I got to get on with my day. No, no. Get real. Go with someone else. They don't need to have a white collar on, Okay. You can come to some of the leaders in the church. They'll be over here to your right and to your left. Leaders, I hope you heard that. I want you to be available to lay hands and pray over some people today. Because if there's some sin, listen, if there's something to be confessed, land the plane. Drop it like it's hot. This is the deal. Okay? This this is what I've been carrying. This is what I've been in denial of. And I'm laying this down at the foot of the cross. The power of the blood has not only given me power over that sin, it's washed it away. And today I am walking a new walk with my king. I'm going to walk in the power and the presence of God. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent, which means white hot, I love this, the effective white hot prayer of a righteous man avails much. We've got some righteous men and women in this place, believe it, that are walking in purity and power of God and they want to lay hands on you. But you need to be real and say, I'm going to get real with God. I'm going to confess my sin. I'm going to take communion. And I'm going to walk in the manifest presence and the power of God from this day forward. If that's your heart, you came to the right place today. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge that You so loved the world that you gave your one and only son, Jesus. So we welcome you here in this place, God. God, it is your kindness that leads us to repentance. We know that there's nothing hidden from your sight. When you said to Adam and Eve, where are you? You already knew. So it's our desire to come out of hiding today. It's our desire, God, to be real with you and acknowledge what you already know. We want to be free, God, today to walk in power, to walk in intimacy with you. 
So we welcome you, God, to break up the fallow ground in our hearts, the bitter roots, God, the unforgiveness, the fear of being abandoned. Weep, mourn, and wail, your word says, God. Instead of tearing our garments, we welcome you to tear our hearts, God. Search my heart, God. Test my thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me, God, in the way everlasting. Church, I invite you now to come, to come to the table, to take the elements. We open up the front of the altar here for you to come before God and prostrate yourself before him. Let's seek the face of our God. Let's worship.
everyone stand to your feet. Sing that from your heart. I will worship you, Lord. Only you, Lord. And I will Jesus, it's all about you. We love you, God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and Holy Spirit, all the strength that you give us by grace. God, as we go, Lord, thank you for clean hands and a pure heart. Thank you, God, that there is therefore no longer condemnation for those in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Holy Spirit, may you make every crooked road straight. And may you be quick to speak the name of Jesus to us that we might proclaim it with all of our heart. Father, we pray all this for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, everyone said. Family, God bless you.